our next guest hosts multiple shows. I mean, he's kind of like a YouTube sensation, dare I say a social media sensation. When I um, put out the lineup for today's show, you know, I thought there'd be, you know, some buzz about Hulk Hogan, Mackenzie Dern, big win. Most of the comments were about our final guest of the day, if I'm being honest. Uh, he is the head coach for one Sugar Sean O'Malley. You may have heard of him. Uh, like I said, a, a, a YouTube personality, a YouTube sensation. Uh, they like to refer to him as the Red Hawk, I do believe. Um, and uh, does a great job online hosting, analyzing. What's going on with the music? We got to do it for the Red Hawk. Oh, okay. This is his music. Okay, right, I didn't know. Is this is this his theme song? The Red Hawk has his own music. All right. Hello, Tim Welch. How are you? Are you coming? Did you did you give us this music? Where is this music coming from? I'm very confused right now. What's up, brother? Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. You got a fantastic setup. You've got your own camera. Is this is that is that your music right there? That's not my music. Hundred percent. Frank, what the fuck was that with the music? <laughs> it's all good. I'm very confused. Do you know what that music is? Have you ever heard this? Frank has never done this before. No. Never heard it. It must have been my my walkout music. Wow. Frank going rogue on us with the music. Okay. Very interesting. Guy, guy turns 47 and goes rogue. Uh, Tim, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, are you okay with how I introduced you? I mean, you kind of are like a bit of a... I mean, I did a deep dive on your YouTube channel yesterday. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on there. Yeah, I mean, it's not my full-time job. It's just kind of a hobby on the side. I don't have kids right now, so I just go to the academy, teach my students, train sugar, and then I have a hobby of just doing YouTube content and stuff. I dig it. And by the way, the students that you're talking about, are you talking about like kids? No, I have I have a, a jiu-jitsu academy and my own MMA academy in Peoria, Arizona. Yes, but are, are you only teaching like pro fighters or are you teaching like youngsters as well? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Dracar Close and Courtney Casey are the head coaches of my MMA program. I'm just the head coach of the, uh, Jiu Jitsu program and I help, uh, help some guys here and there with the, their MMA stuff also. Okay. Um, so let's get into it. Some very exciting times in your life, in Sean's life. By the way, um, how did you meet Sean O'Malley? When did that go down? Uh, I was fighting in Bellator when I was 21 years old and uh, I went back to Montana to commentate some fights and I remember seeing Sean when he was 16 years old a little skinny kid with an afro I'm like oh he's pretty talented in there pretty athletic and then I came back two years later to commentate some more fights and he was fighting a college wrestler and I I knew the gym he was training from so I was like I figured this college wrestler is probably going to beat him up and then uh, Sean armbarred the kid so after at the after party I went up to Sean and said hey do you want to come down and uh, train at a real gym with some real pros. And he was he was all about it. And when he was 18, he came down, got beat up. I figured I wouldn't see him. Went home, saved up $2,000, packed his car, and moved down. And we've been uh, good buddies ever since. Wow. So, so he got beat up that time, and you thought that that would be it for him? Yeah. When I picked him up from the airport, he never trained with a good pro or a good black belt yet. And he was like, man, we're going to go to the top. I can't wait. We're going to take over the game. I'm like, you have no clue, kid. Yeah. You have no clue. And and every day we went into the lab, he was just getting smoked by the teenagers, by everyone. And after practices, he would sometimes be crying and he would just, he would just look so defeated after practices. Um, and I figured we probably won't see him again. Wow. And uh, he packed up his car and cruised down. And and what year is this around? Like how long ago is this? This was when I was 21 years old. So I'm 33 now. So that was about 12 years ago. Okay. And you had a pretty good run as well as a, as a fighter. Like you said, fought for Bellator among others. Ultimately, why did you stop fighting? Just injuries, injuries, back to back to back injuries and just being broke and then getting getting bills in the mail for for um, post fight surgeries and stuff going in debt. And I was just I was just bummed out about it. Just uh, I broke my jaw my last fight and it was a pretty severe break in my, and I was wired shut for a while. So I just started kind of helping out coaching a little bit and um and I just started really liking it and really focusing on my jujitsu in the gi and no gi. And then it just kind of kind of came naturally me starting to teach. And, and now I have my own program in my own academy. So Yeah, and um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you also, did you try out for season two of The Ultimate Fighter? Like you were in like one of those elimination houses to get into the, uh, elimination fights to get into the house? 
Yeah, I tried out for 170 and I, I tried out for the 170 show and I was 195 pounds at the time. And the producers brought me back, said, we want you on the show, but we're cutting all the 170ers. Can you make 55? And I was like, fuck, I, I, I probably could. And I said, how long? They said three months. So I cut from 195 to 155 and it was super unhealthy and then went in there and had a good scrap, but my body just wasn't 100% that low of a weight. So um, the coaching thing, the idea to be a coach, was that just – you know, something that came to you later on as a result of coming to the realization that your career was coming to an end or in the back of your mind as a fighter, did you always think that you wanted to be a coach when it was all said and done? I knew I was going to want to be a, a coach. I used to, for a while, training at Team Quest with, when Chael Sonnen was getting ready for Anderson. I used to live with uh, Robert Fallis. Wow. And I was just I was just fascinated by him and, and all the books he read and all the stuff he was into and him just being a mastermind. So after living with him for a while, I knew after fighting I'd want to be a coach, and it came a lot sooner than I expected. The late Robert Fallis, uh, who was such an incredible coach, and it was um... – such a shock when when he passed away. Did did you know that he was dealing with, you know, some issues that were you know were were, were haunting him for lack of a better word? Yeah, I think only two people in his life knew his his uh, girlfriend at the time, and then maybe his brother. But other than that, he he was just the one you go to for the answers. He had the answer for everyone. He was always pumping up everyone, getting them motivated, and he just seemed like such an intelligent guy, the most intelligent guy that I knew. And I looked up to him so much, and I wanted to be a lot like him. And it it came to a pretty big shock to me when that happened. Um, when did you start to realize that Sean had something in him that he was different that 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 he could actually become a very successful MMA fighter? I knew he was a, a great athlete, and I knew it's it's rare when someone you when the lights go on and they're in the cage, they show up every time. And I saw that early on and he had a lot of amateur fights. I think he had around 14 amateur fights, but he didn't wrestle in high school. He didn't have that, uh, grappling background. So I'm like, that's so hard to catch up on these days, but he was so disciplined going to the gym twice a day, taking his ass whoopings, taking his ass whoopings over and over. And he's just been sticking with it. So probably, after about his third professional fight, I really knew this kid's probably going to be something special because he's so athletic, he's so gifted, um, his eyes are so good, he's, he's his speed's so good, his reaction time's so good, and then it's backed by just a really good committed work ethic. And a lot of people need like motivation from their coach to keep showing up. He's not that type. He's the last one that needs motivation from his coach. He's going to do everything top to bottom. He's going to be to every practice, probably 20, 30 minutes early, getting his mind ready for the practice and uh, getting his body warmed up. So he, he's always been super disciplined. That's when I knew I was like, man, this kid could probably take it pretty far. You are his coach. Uh, fair to also say you are his friend. Um, dare I say like a very close friend, right? Yeah, I mean, we we got an apartment when he moved down, an old crappy apartment that was seven hundred dollars. We were both broke, and we just kind of, kind of grew up together, and uh, just yeah, been going through life together. And he's probably one of my best friends, and yeah, I'm kind of his coach to him too. Yeah, so it's interesting because like a lot of you know historically, forget even boxing because it's a totally different thing there. But like even in MMA, like you think of like a Greg Jackson or a Faraz Zahabi, all all these you know um, Henry Hoof. You, you you see the coach fighter relationship, but you rarely see them on the level of you and Sean. Like you guys seem like two peas in a pod. Like you seem like legit best buds to the point where you're, you know, hosting your own podcast together. The um is it the Sugar and Timbo show or is it the Timbo and Sugar show? I'm I, I keep forgetting. Yeah, the Timbo and Sugar show. Timbo, you're the A side. You go first. Yeah, that's right. Um <laughs> so like, you know, it's it's different. Um there there's not like that line there, so to speak, where where it kind of gets blurred. Um, do you think that works to your advantage? Is that just something like, would you, would you prefer not to be best friends with people that you coach? Do you even think about these things? It's very rare to see something like this, a relationship like this. Yeah, I, I know how rare it is, but he, he's so good at when it, when we're in the room, when it's time for the coaching to side to turn on, he's really good at just listening. And when we're, when we're outside of the gym, um, we're always messing around. And I, I think it's good because I don't have I don't have kids right now. I don't have a lot of other things to do besides just study fighting, be in the training room, coach my students. Um, so I get a lot of focus and things I'm reading or th things that I'm studying that stick out to me. I'm constantly messaging it to him. So we got a good relationship and uh, it, it works out good because he knows when to shut off the friendship. Mm. And 
and I know when to. It just kind of came naturally. I know it is pretty rare. Yeah. Um, the great Chael Sonnen, who you just referenced, uh, has called you one of the most brilliant minds in MMA. When you hear something like that from someone like Chael, how does that make you feel? I mean, <laughs> there's guys out there that have been around the sport way longer than me, and there's guys that are just on another level than me. But as long as I just stay hungry and keep learning and try to just become an expert in all these areas, um, I think one day I could be one of the greatest, I mean, one of the best minds in MMA. But right now there's guys that are way more smart than me. So I was going to, I do ask, think it helps that I fought in the past. Sure. A hundred percent. I was going to ask you, do you, do you, you put yourself in the category with some of those coaches that I just referenced, you know, the, the, the name, the great names, um, there's a lot of great, you know, Eugene Behrman's the Ray Longo. Is Tim Welch in that in that category now? I don't know. All, all the things I've I've done, I've on the TV show uh, Bellator's Fight Master. Greg Jackson was my coach for a while. Living with with Robert Fallis, training under John Crouch for eight years. It's just things I've learned from these guys, and I'm I'm putting it back into my guys. So it's just things I've took from other people. To say I'm up there with one of the best, I would say no, not not right now because. I haven't really done a ton coaching, but I think one day I could be. Well, you're about to uh, go into your first UFC title fight as a coach, right? I mean, this is a big one. It's uh, Sean versus Aljo, August 19th. Last time we saw Sean was in October. As his coach, would you have preferred there not be so much time in between his last fight and his title fight? Mm. Yeah, but he was putting together... Well, together a lot of fights back to back a lot of camps back to back and his body was beat down and it's for been 10 years of him fighting constantly be, besides that little two years suspension so given his body just time to heal and rest and still stay disciplined um he wanted to fight he wanted to fight earlier than that but the ufc just kind of were just like oh let's just kind of wait around for it uh so i don't think it I don't think it was bad because now his body's healed up. He's ready for this uh, training camp. It's going to be a long one against Aljo, so his body's going to be ready for it. How did you feel about the Piotr Jan fight? How did you feel about his performance? Did you think he had done enough to win before they read the scorecards? I knew it was going to be close because it's just it's just so hard with each judge. You don't know how they're scoring these takedowns. Even if he gets a takedown, it does nothing. You don't know if the if that that. Uh, judge wrestled in the past and he's counting something for those. So I knew it was going to be close, but if it's based on damage, look at Peter's face, look at his face. I knew there was a possibility that we were going to get our hand raised and we did. So, um, were you hoping that the title fight came again? You know, he, Sean told me, was it last week, two weeks ago that he was hoping for Henry. He put it on Twitter as well, that he wanted Henry to win because he wanted to punch him in the face as, as the coach. Now feelings aside, who are you hoping was going to win that fight in Newark? I was hoping Henry also, just because the accolades he has. He, he he's double champ, Olympic champ, and if Sugar laid him face plant, uh, face first and KO'd him, then that would just be that much sweeter. Plus, he is kind of annoying, and I think a lot of people wanted that. But Aljo won, so we got to get prepared for him. Aljo's, I think, the most dangerous bantamweight of all time, and it's going to be a fun challenge getting ready for him. Uh, there's been a lot of drama with this date. How, how do you feel about? everything that's going on now between Aljo and the UFC, even just moments ago, Aljo tweeting to Dana and stuff like that. A lot going on here that doesn't really pertain to you guys at all, other than the fact that you're fighting on the date. But uh, there's a lot of back and forth on on that side of the fence. How do you feel about how this has all been handled? I mean, it, it does kind of suck for Aljo, just having to get pushed in there and not really getting a say. But the UFC knows what they're doing. The UFC knows what they're doing. Um, so I just try to stay out of that, but I, I do see Aljo going off about how, who's the smarter one taking all these fights. I'd be curious to see who made more money in those months. I know Aljo fought three times and sugar only fought that once, but still with his brand deals, with his merch company, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they made a similar amount of money. So really who's the smarter one, maybe. Uh, he, he did a video that he posted yesterday, watching you guys talk about him. Did you see this video? The one where he's like looking at the, uh, the phone and talking about math and science and, and days between and all that stuff. Yeah, I saw. Yeah. What did you think of that? I mean, I don't know why, I, I don't know why Aljo doesn't have a lot of fans. Is it because he's, he's a little annoying? He doesn't, why, why don't people get behind him? Do you think? 
Oh, you're turning the tables on me here, Tim? No, we're not doing this yeah, now. Yeah, I was wondering. Look at okay, you. Okay, look okay, at, okay. By the way, that okay, was good. Sorry, sorry. No, no, I can, I, we can have this conversation. But by the way, it's it's good because I feel like now the Red Hawk is coming out. Like I feel – because I could – most coaches will be like, I don't want to get involved in any of this. But you're like an MMA personality. Like this is – you know, you guys go through all the drama and all the news on your show. So this is kind of your wheelhouse, no? Uh, I mean, a little bit. We got two shows, so there's a lot to talk about each week. So we just got to say a bunch of random shit. <laughs> uh, why do you think? I mean, I think that uh, a lot of it probably stems from the Jan fight, right? Where people thought that he was quote unquote faking. And then I think he leaned into it probably a little too much. Aljo and I uh, actually had a falling out a little bit because I didn't like that after, right after that Jan fight. If you remember the next day, him and Cejudo had a face off, right? And there were all the pictures that came out with him holding the belt. and he didn't like the fact that I said on the show with DC that like, you know, if you weren't really happy with the way the fight went down with Jan, the first one I'm talking about, like, don't do the face off with Cejudo. Don't take the pictures with the belt. Like say, Hey, I'm only going to touch this belt when I beat this guy fair and square, that type of thing. So he was upset. And, and I think a lot of fans have, have still hung on to that. I do feel like some of it is turning though. Now, especially after the win um, over Cejudo. Like, I feel like he's starting to finally get that respect from the people. Do you agree with that? Or are you getting a lot of people saying, you know, we, we hope that you, you beat this guy up. No, I agree with that. I mean, he's grinding on his YouTube too. And as all his numbers are growing, I think people are going to get behind him. If you keep get keep winning, no matter what, people are going to slowly start getting behind you. And that's what he's doing. So do, do you feel like the UFC wants you guys to win? Oh, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> having sugar be the champion i mean what other bantamweight in history has just one punched people and walked off like mark hunt a mm. bantamweight a tall skinny kid with tattoos and curly hair one punching people and walking off um the ufc knows what they're doing sugar's a, a, a big superstar and the ufc helped with that so i'm sure the ufc would love to see a ko artist that's as flashy as sean be the champion uh, I did see recently you gave some some love to Aljo. You, you think he's the toughest guy in the division? Would you say he's the toughest matchup right now for Sean, given his skill set? Oh, for sure. For sure. Because our professor, uh, Augusto Taquino Mendez, he won the ADCC championship, and he's very strong. He's very strong, and he's one of the best grapplers in the planet at that way. And he just even talked about how strong Aljo is. He's just so physically strong and he's not only a good wrestler who's going to get on top and just sit in the guard and not know how to pass the guard. He's going to pass. He's going to advance. He's going to move to half guard, punch you, move to mount, take your back. He's really good at jujitsu and he's the expert back taker. You make one mistake with Aljo, he's going to be on your back for the rest of the round. And he's, he's physical and he's an athlete and he's not super basic on his feet. He's super funky on his feet. He's just throwing random kind of spazzy stuff. It makes it super dangerous. It makes him hard to prepare for. And uh, I definitely think he's the most dangerous bantamweight. So that said, like what, you know, we haven't seen him lose in a while. Um, it was the Marlon Moraes fight, which yeah, I know you could say he was probably en route to losing the first Jan fight, but he didn't actually lose it. Who knows what would have happened? What's the key to beating him? I mean, he makes a lot of mistakes too. You see him dropping his hands, dipping his head. Henry's only 5'2", and he almost smacked a head kick on Aljo, um, and he's hitting him. So the key is going to be, I mean, good footwork. It's going to be a big cage. That'll be a big difference. I think the small cage had a lot to do with Corey Sanhagen and Aljo, him sprinting right at him, double-legging him, getting his back. Um and then obviously you have to be able to sprawl, have to be able to sprawl and just be careful when you're getting up. He wants you to go to all fours and get up so he can body triangle your back. And he's an expert in that area. So, and, and there's a lot of things on the ground that people haven't seen from sugar. There's no, every, the plan against sugar, his whole career, he spins, he does flashy stuff as is pressure him. Pressure him, pressure him, pressure him, put him on the cage, take him down. That's every single game plan of people's uh, fights. When they fight him, that's been their game plan. So we've been preparing for that kind of stuff for the last 10 years. Um, Aljo's a whole different animal, so we're going to find out what happens. Um, Demetrius Johnson, Captain Eric Albarracin, even Cejudo have talked about like his his takedown technique um, and you know how it's a little bit frustrating. DJ was on the show saying like what he thought Henry should have done when he when he drops down to his knees and whatnot. What can you guys do to counter that? Yeah, I'm like Aljo's very lucky it's not one FC, right? I mean, <laughs> right. Where, where, where he can where he can shoot in there, but he is long. Like Henry even defended the takedowns perfectly, and he was in a front headlock, and he still had his long arms 
his long arms class, still driving him, trying to find the fence to where he can build up. Um, we have some good wrestlers here in Phoenix, wrestlers that are better than Aljo, the guys like Bryce Meredith. Um, there's a handful of just really good wrestlers, and we're just going to be working a lot with them on making the the right decisions and having the right reactions when Aljo takes his shots. Why do they call you Red Hawk? Oh, that was my uh, – actually, John Crouch made that nickname up. That was my uh, name in when I was fighting. Okay, just because just of the red hair? Yeah, I think so. And I'm, I'm like a quarter Indian, Native American. Wow, okay. Um, by the way, are, are you aware of the um, resemblance that you have to the great Canelo Alvarez? I mean, it's it's pretty unbelievable. Have you heard this before? Probably almost every time I go in a public place. <laughs> People every think, especially in, especially in Phoenix, everyone's uh, Mexican, so they all think I'm Canelo. Um, we're showing a side by side right now. I mean, it's uncanny the resemblance. Is it, <laughs> are there any perks to this? I mean, it could be worse. A lot of people sometimes say Sam Alvey, and I'm like, damn it, or or like they they even say CB Dalloway, and I'm like, damn it, but <laughs> Canelo it could be worse, I guess. Yeah, it could be worse. Um, what is your 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 uh, wake up routine like? I have a good I have a good morning routine. Yes, I, I, I think us? I have one of the best. Yes, I've, I've heard I, about it. I mean, I wake. I mean, I wake up and I have some really nice red light therapy machines, and then I have a, a PEMF machine where I put it on my different joints and joints that I need my inflammation. Um, make sure I get hydrated, and then do a little stretch, and then I make my uh, my perfect espresso. So I have a I have a pretty good dialed in routine, and then I'll sit down and maybe read for half an hour. How long does the whole Before, routine last? Probably about 45 minutes, For, probably and, about 45 minutes. And then I'll get prepped up and then head to the academy. And uh, is this like upon waking up, you get into the red light, you do all this stuff, or is there a bit of a, you know, a grace period after waking up? Usually right after, I, right when I wake up, I walk outside to my cold plunge and it's 40 degrees Damn. and it doesn't get easier, but it gets more familiar. So I wake up every day and that thing really wakes me up, gets all me, gets my uh, brain running right. What about the phone? Like how long into the morning are you looking at your phone? That to me is the big one that I want to try to eliminate in my life. Probably 40 minutes, probably 40 minutes before I take my phone off airplane mode and start looking at the emails. Wow. That is impressive. You have the, the mental fortitude to not look at your phone for 40 minutes upon waking up. Where do you keep your phone when you go to bed? I put it in the kitchen, but Sugar's been Sugar's been waking up and not looking at his phone till after the first practice, which ends around eleven thirty or twelve. He's been waking up, doing his more morning routine, going feeding his chickens, getting his sunlight, reading, doing what he needs to do, and he's not even looking at his phone till eleven thirty. Because for someone with the following that he has, I can't even imagine the amount of emails and calls yeah. and all the people that want to contact him. So. He's he's way better at than I am. He waits till eleven thirty now. Eleven thirty. That man, I'm impressed. Is there a trick? Like what what is it? Should I just put it in airplane mode and put it in the kitchen? Like seems easier said than done, but the second I wake up, I look at the damn phone. I don't want to do that. And then you're there's some like bullshit text or tweet and it just like ruins the start of your day. What what app do you open up first usually? The first first app? Mm -hmm. Does text count? So you check your text first. Yeah, check the text first because that's like the immediate – then probably Twitter, I have to say. And I hate it. I really want to stop. I wonder how much more creative you would be if you didn't – first thing, you wake up and get other people's problems directly into your inbox. If you just let your mind cook for a little bit, you'd probably be way more creative, maybe. God, I see this is a good coach right here. I, I, see, I love the way you're, you're saying that. Someone once told me like our minds are not hotel rooms. You can't just let people check in and out of your mind. And that's what we do when we are on our phone looking at Twitter, Instagram, and all this bullshit. Yeah, and especially reminding Sugar of that because when he's not fighting or when he's injured, there's YouTube, there's all these business opportunities. Being able to shut that off for the next three months and telling people, hey, don't even contact him. Don't even talk to him. I'm not even going to bring up anything about podcasts or money. We got to just focus on our training, our sessions each day and let his mind focus on what he needs to do. I think that's, I mean, I think it's powerful. Well, when you guys are preparing for the fight, like leading up to the fight, will you stop the podcast? No, I mean, but we don't prepare for it. Right. I think we need to hire someone or a producer that prepares for it, prepares topics, prepares things. We show up and we just talk about the shit we're going through. So sometimes it's not very well prepared, 
So once it's our main focus, we'll probably build it into a, a bigger show. Would love to have like a Jerry Springer type show one day. Jerry Springer? What do you mean? By, like, by the way, you're set up there with the yeah. desk, and it's like you've got like a like a proper like late night show setup. I saw this one interview that you did with uh, I think it was like two OnlyFans models, and you're asking them all kinds of crazy questions. I was like, wow, this is Tim Welch. Like you're wearing crazy glasses and stuff. It's almost like you have an alter ego. Yeah, I mean, I've always been like that. That's just the way I am, I guess. Just not really giving a fuck, and uh, and that's just in the in the back of my gym. I, I, we're in an old shitty, uh, oh wow, shitty mall, rundown mall, and that's five thousand square foot gym that I pay five thousand dollars a month for. We have the gym in the front, and we have our two podcast studios in the back. So the setup is pretty pretty nice, and it's nice with, on the interviews that when I can talk however I want because I I really can't get fired. True. So what like. What are you trying to emulate? What's the goal with the podcast? Just whatever, I guess, whatever interests me. When I, when I want to show up, if I'm thinking about chicks that day, if I'm thinking about uh, drugs that day, if I'm thinking about religion that day, whatever's interest interests me at that moment or whatever books I'm into at that moment, I can talk about them on the podcast and give them back. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little like old school Howard Stern-esque. Were you a fan of him? I never watched much Howard Stern. Uh, oh, wow. Maybe maybe I need to. Yeah, yeah. Um, you would like like '90s Howard Stern was tremendous. Um, are are you a big um, you know, partaker of drugs? Do you, do you, you know do you, do you dabble? I used to, I used to a lot be into uh, marijuana a lot more, but recently I haven't been smoking barely at all. Maybe maybe once a week, and I just feel more clear minded. So really, the biggest drug I I do is just. Every day I do my caffeine and I don't abuse it. I don't really do the caffeine after 1 p.m. or I can't sleep. Other than that, drugs wise, I don't mind dabbling and trying different drugs, but ones that are consistent and ones that are not good for my health, I'm pretty good at sticking away from. So uh, I love like my favorite, one of my favorite like stretches of the day, 20, 30 minutes coffee i have a nice little i like an almond cappuccino if i'm being honest that's sort of like my thing i get very excited and i heard you reference the perfect espresso and you just mentioned the caffeine again so what is the perfect espresso well before i would use the aeropress it's this little like little uh plastic tube where you put um it, it, it you get two shots of espresso from it and you cook it at the right temperature and it's a self press thing it's a pretty cool thing and uh but now i, I got on reddit and i just researched the best espresso machines out there and i found this one called the gagia classic okay and it took a little while to get a hang of my girlfriend pretty much most of the time makes it but i like to get that uh, espresso and do a little scoop of uh, coconut oil a little scoop of butter a little bit of vanilla a touch of cinnamon and some honey and really froth that puppy up and and oh my god it's wow beautiful. so so wow that's a lot of stuff so you you do you take the two shots and then you put all that stuff in and then you froth it all together well, usually I froth the milk first, froth okay. the milk first, and then I make sh make that little mixture in the milk wow. with the coconut oil, with the butter, with the, a little bit of cinnamon, with a touch of vanilla extract, and then the honey, and then I put my espresso in, and it's just perfection. And did you make this up, or did you read about this somewhere else? Uh, so I pretty much made that drink up, and I, I plan on having a coffee shop one day where I serve that drink. Oh, my gosh. That's one of my dreams, by the way, to own my own coffee shop. I wanted to have a coffee shop slash barber shop where they're kind of connected, but they're completely separate. But like you go through a door and then you could go to the other one, but they look a little bit different. But it, you, I mean, you can hang out there for hours if you want. That's always been something I've wanted to do. When do you think you'll do that? It's a great question, Tim. You know, you ask good questions, by the way. You're good at this. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I have a lot of dreams. I also want to own a Westphalia. Like I want to get this car. See this car right here? I just want to go that on road easy. trips. With my kids. Yeah, but you, you kind of have to – there's none – they're all, like, beat up from the 70s. There's none that are, like, really good, you know, in good condition. You kind of mm -hmm. have to – I have dreams. I just don't actually, you know – I'm too focused on the work, <laughs> yeah. on the interviewing the damn yeah. fighters and stuff, you know? I mean, that's why you're the best MMA show out there. Well, I appreciate that. I think you said that to the other guys that you were on earlier this week. I heard you Who? say that. No, none. I don't know. None, none. That's true. I was actually on the, uh, the uh, Timbo and Sugar show once. I know. I think YouTube like uh, yeah, blocked happened? that one. It was such. We were so pumped about that. We were pumped about the interview. We we're like, God, this one's gonna do so well. And they just must have, must have shadow banned it for some reason. You think so? Maybe we were, maybe we were cussing or talking about bad things before and after. But I don't know what happened to that one. Yeah, because like the views tanked, right? 
Yeah, YouTube YouTube's weird. You gotta you gotta keep up on that algorithm, don't I you? I hate that damn algorithm. Sometimes I mean it's like you think you got a banger and it like produces ten thousand views. And you're like, what the hell happened here? And then you see some other crap and it has like five hundred thousand views on some other channel. And you're like, what did I do wrong? It doesn't make sense. But uh I, I would love to come back because like a lot of people have said he'll want equals ratings, and I felt like it was a blow to my ego that I didn't deliver for you guys. No, that wasn't your fault. That was YouTube's fault, hundred percent. Okay. So, um, and by the way, the, the stuff that you do in the back with the watermelons and the, the swords and all that stuff, is that part of the routine as well? Or is that just, that's like just, a... that's just, yeah, that's just spur of the moment. Just, uh, yeah, I got this sword custom made in Montana. So I just wanted to put it to work a little bit. And I, I also shoot, uh, um, traditional bows. I'm pretty good with those. Wow. So you're a man of many interests. Yeah. You still, you still talk yep. to Hasbula? You guys still close? No, he doesn't speak English, so it was hard to communicate with him. Okay. <laughs> mm, you just go, ah, you kind of give him a nudge, and that's about it. Uh, who's your dream guest on the show? That, that we, we get that question a lot. The dream guest, I would probably be, that is such a tough one. I would say maybe not Donald Trump. Wow. Maybe someone, I, I, it's hard to say. I can't even pick. I can't even pick. What about you? Who's your dream guest? Man, you keep doing this. You keep throwing it back to me. Can I tell you something? Just, uh, I don't know. Should I say it? Lean Let it rip. It. Just yesterday, I was offered to have Donald Trump on this show. Damn. Not sure if I'm going to do it. How come? It's just too poll. I try to stay away from all the politics stuff. You know, I wouldn't have whoever the Democratic nominee i don't even know who it is I, I i don't really like any of that stuff i feel it's very divisive yeah but you could probably have a good interview with him and talk about the affliction days and how those oh, yeah. stuff you know i interviewed him at the press conference for affliction uh this is well before any of the politics stuff he was at the press conference announcing uh i think it was affliction one or two and he it was at trump tower and so if you type in ariel hawani donald trump there's like a two-minute interview of us talking about Josh Barnett and Fyodor Almanenko. It's kind of surreal in retrospect. Damn, that's pretty badass. Yeah. I thought you would say, have you ever had Chael? Would love to have Chael on, for sure. Would have, I've never even hit him up. Maybe when he's in Phoenix, would love to have him in studio or something. But yeah, yeah Chael's the man. Chael's the man. There was a cool one when you had Mike Goldberg on, and he like, you know he commentated on a sugar fight. Obviously he, he hasn't since he left the UFC, but I thought that that was really cool. And I think it really warmed his heart that you guys asked him to do that. Yeah. And that was, that was pretty cool. Cause I've always been a fan of Mike Goldberg. Can I ask you one question? Sure. Who would be your ultimate commentator that uh, you'd like to put in there? Meaning for UFC? Yeah. Say for UFC. I mean, the coolest would probably be Howard Cosell. I mean, uh, uh, alive or dead, or does it have to be alive? Uh no, alive or dead. Yeah, I mean how I mean, could you imagine Howard Cosell calling a UFC fight? That would be wild. Yeah. That would be Yeah, that one. would be good. He was the guy that for me. Good. He was the one I told my parents in two thousand one, I want to be the Howard Cosell of uh of MMA. Obviously I, I will never be the Howard Cosell of MMA. He's incomparable, but um one thing he did say, Tim, was he always told it like it is. And so I've tried to do that as well. Yeah, that's pretty badass. Um, how does it end on August 19th? What are you envisioning? I just, uh, people, Sugar's reaction times are so good. And if you make a mistake striking, look at Peter Yawn, how high his guard is and how sharp of a striker he was. And Sugar was able to find his chin and drop him. I just cannot see. I cannot see. I mean, I think Sugar's going to crack him. I think he's going to hurt him, wobble him, and Alger's going to take a shitty shot. And he's probably going to put him to sleep one way or another. Wow, what a scene that would be. Well, I, I wish you guys the best as you prepare for the fight. This was a lot of fun, Tim. Thank you for coming on. Keep up all the great work as far as the coaching is concerned, but also the content. Uh, you're, you're, um, you're an internet darling, as they say. The people really love you and, uh, and have your back. And I like the alter ego as well. By the way, when you're in the alter ego state, are you the Red Hawk or is there a different name for that? Or is that just Timbo? What, like, who is that guy with the glasses and the crazy shirts and all that stuff? You know, I wear those glasses because the lighting in our studio is so bright <laughs> that you'll get a headache if you don't wear them. Okay. So that's why I wear those glasses. But there's not all to ego. That's just me. And my students know it and everyone knows it. That's just that's just me.
Well, much respect keeping you, my man, and uh, good luck to you guys as you prepare for the, uh, the title fight on August 19th, and thank you for coming on. We'll do it again soon. Ariel, you're the man. See you later, brother. All right, there he is, Tim Welch, the head coach for one Sugar Sean O'Malley. What a uh, what an interesting character.